We will now continue with our study of resistance, current, and voltage. Let's uh, do another example. A conductor of uniform radius 1.5 centimeter. You got the radius of the conductor. Once you know the radius, you can calculate the area of cross section. Is that right? Because area of cross section of a conductor is a circle. The area of a circle is pi r squared. <coughs> Carries a current of 5 ampere. If the electric field in the wire is 150 volt per meter, what is the resistivity of the material? Okay, let's pick our data. What do we have here? We have the radius is 1.5 centimeter, which is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 2 meter. The area of cross section of the wire is pi r squared. That will be, we know the value of r, and that will be pi times the radius squared gives us 7.1 times 10 to the negative 4 meter squared. The current is 5 ampere. Now, we have enough information here to find... What else do we have? Do we have anything else? Well, we have the electric field. Well, let's see what we can do with the electric field. Now, let the length of the conductor delta x be equal to L. Right, here is the conductor. Now, remember, this is a circle. When I drew it, it the cross-section looked oval, but it's supposed to be a circle. Now, the length of that conductor, delta x equal to L. The electric field is E in the conductor. There is an electric field E in that conductor. And you know that E equal to delta V over delta X. Do you rec recall that? The potential difference, the electric field between two electrodes maintained at a potential difference delta V. And if the distance between the two electrodes is delta X, then E, the electric field, is delta V divided by delta X. Now here... Delta X is the distance between the ends of the conductor and Delta V is the potential difference between the ends of the conductor. And so E equal to V over L. I'm going to write Delta V as V, the potential difference, and Delta X as L, the length of the conductor. Now, that can be used to calculate V, the potential difference. Is that right? If V is the potential difference across the conductor, then V equal to E times L. And we know the value of E. We know the value of E, but we don't know the value of L. So we will leave it as E times L. E is 150 volts per meter multiplied by L meter, and that is the potential difference across the ends of this conductor. Well, we can also obtain an expression like this for the resistance. Resistance involves the length, it involves the area of cross-section. Is that right? All right, let's... Um, so, the potential difference V equal to 150L volt. So, 150L is the potential difference. Okay, we now know all these values. We know the area of cross-section is this. The potential difference between the ends of the conductor is 150L volts. Now, the resistance of the conductor, can you give me the equation for the resistance in terms of length and area of cross-section? It'll be, well, we can write R equal to V over I, where V is the potential difference and I is the current. We know the current, 
we know the value of i and we know v equal to 150L so let's write it as r equal to 150L volt divided by 5 ampere and that is 5 goes in 150 30 times so this will be 30L ohm that is the resistance of that conductor but resistance is rho L over A in terms of length and the area of cross-section. Now, that will be, we can now write the value of the resistance is 30 L. And if R equal to rho L over A, we could say 30 L equal to rho L over A. Is that right? I will replace R by 30 L. What happens on either side, L will cancel. That means L has disappeared. We don't need the length. And what are we looking for? Therefore, rho equal to 30A. Rho equal to 30A. And A is the area of cross-section. That would be 30 times 7.1 times 10 to the negative 4. And that will be 0 0.0. 0.021 ohm meter is the resistivity. I would like you to look through this problem one more time. It's got many elements that you need to take note of. All right, one more example. A certain light bulb has a tungsten filament with a resistance of 19 ohm at room temperature. Room temperature is our 20 degrees Celsius and 140 ohm when hot at a higher temperature. Find the temperature of the filament when it is hot. Well, that's where you will uh, use the equation connecting the resistance at any temperature to the resistance at 20 degrees Celsius. Can you recall that equation? R equal to R20 times 1 plus alpha times t minus 20, where we need to find that t. Let's pick our data. Resistance at 20 degrees, R20 is 19 ohm. Resistance at a temperature t, R sub t, is 140 ohm. We need to find that temperature. Alpha, the temperature coefficient of resistivity, of resistance, of tungsten, from the tables is 4.5 times 10 to the negative 3 per Kelvin. And we will use this equation, RT equal to R20 times 1 plus alpha T minus 20. We know all these values except T. We need to solve for T. So 140 equal to 19 times 1 plus 4.5 times 10 to the negative 3 times T minus 20. All right, let's solve for T. Now, what I did is I isolated this term. You see, I divided 140 by 19. Divide both sides by 19, left side becomes 140 divided by 19 is 7.37. And on the right side I have 1 plus 4.5 times 10 to the 3 times t minus 20. Now distribute that term. Or move the 1 to the right side, 7.37 Minus 1 is 6.37. Now we are ready to solve for this. Do you understand this step? T minus 20 divide both sides by 4.5 times 10 to the negative 3. So T minus 20 equal to 6.37 divided by, that's a division sign, divided by 4.5 times 10 to the negative 3. And you need to put that in the calculator and see what that gives you. That gives you 1,415.6 1, and therefore T 
equal to 1435.6 degrees Celsius and that is the temperature of the tungsten filament at that hot temperature. Alright, let's now talk about electric cell. What is an electric cell? Well, in order that an electric current may flow continuously, the potential difference between the two plates need to be maintained. Now, I told you some time ago that this is an electric battery. Now, very often we use the term battery in the wrong sense. A battery is actually a collection of things. Now, a device that will build and maintain a potential difference between two electrodes chemically is called an electric cell. Now, what I'm holding is actually an electric cell. It has a positive electrode and a negative electrode. The chemical action between the electrodes and the electrolyte inside builds and maintains a potential difference between the two electrodes. And that is the characteristic of an electric cell. Now this can be achieved only if the negative charges can be removed from the positive plate and deposited back in the negative plate. As, as negative charges move from the negative end to the positive end, you need to move the negative charges from the positive back to the negative internally to the cell. And that internal movement of charges is actually done by the chemical action inside the cell. Alright, so when you have a negative electrode and a positive electrode, connect the two by means of a conductor. Negative charges drift from the negative electrode to the positive. Now, in order to maintain the potential difference, we now need to move the negative charges from the positive back to the negative. Then only the potential difference can be maintained. Now, this can be done chemically by placing the two metal plates in a suitable chemical so that electrons can be removed from the positive electrode and deposited at the negative electrode. And that is what is happening inside a cell. Now here we have a cell. I showed this to you some time ago. We have an electrolyte and two electrodes. Zinc plate and a copper plate. Do you remember the ones I showed you? You have electrolyte inside a container and you have a copper plate and a zinc plate. If I can now connect those two. Now, if I can connect these electrodes, there we are, and put them in the electrolytes. Let me see if I can show that to you. Now here I have a little electrolyte inside that container and these electrodes, one is copper, the other is zinc. I put them in the electrolyte and now if I connect one end to a meter, well I'm connecting it to a voltmeter and you can see here, well, that's if you can. Well, is it possible for you to see? There you can see the, the needle actually is reading one volt. I have, I have been able to build a potential difference of one volt between these electrodes. When I take it away, it falls down. So, this is now an electric cell. I have made an electric cell. These are the electrodes and inside the electrolyte. Okay, so that is an, basically an electric cell. So, what are the parts of an electric cell? 
you have uh, two electrodes and the electrolyte. The chemical action builds, makes one electrode positive by removing electrons from it and depositing it in the zinc. So the zinc becomes negative and copper becomes positive. You connect the two externally by a conductor. Negative charges move from zinc to copper externally and from copper to zinc internally so that you have a complete closed path for the flow of electric charges. Such an arrangement is an electric cell. Now the conducting plates are called electrodes. So you have a copper electrode and a zinc electrode and the chemical is called an electrolyte. A simple cell can be produced by dipping a copper plate and a zinc plate in dilute sulfuric acid. That's what I just showed you and that's this arrangement. And how do you represent a cell in an electrical circuit? Look at the symbol. It's a, it's a long thin line with a thick short line and these blue lines are the connecting leads. In other words, if I have this cell, I have a cell here, I'm going to show that to you. Well, let me get my office depot thing so that I can show you the electric uh, cell. Okay. Give me a second, I'll be with you. Now here I have an electric cell and uh, these are the electrodes and I have connected them by means of a conducting wire. You see, these are the connecting leads that are shown by these blue lines. So you got a positive end, this is the positive end of the cell, and this is the negative end. Okay. Now the thin long wire line is the positive, and the thick short one is the negative. When the negative pole of the cell is connected to the positive by means of a conducting wire, Electrons drift from the negative to the positive externally through the conductor and from the positive to the negative internally so that the charges flow in a closed path. If the closed chain is broken, the current will cease to exist. Electric current will flow only in a closed path. The chemical action between the electrodes and the electrolyte in the cell builds and maintains a potential difference between the two plates. Now, the potential difference that is built and maintained between the electrodes is called electromotive force of the cell. Every cell has an electromotive force. And what is it? is a measure of the potential difference between the electrodes that is built and maintained as a result of the chemical action. And electromotive force is in short called EMF of the cell, electromotive force. We will represent this by the uppercase E. So, every cell has an EMF. Now, this cell has an EMF, I can measure it by connecting it to the voltmeter. Now, is it possible for you to read what this meter gives you? Can you read that? What does the meter read? It reads the EMF. When you connect the cell directly to the voltmeter, it actually reached the EMF. Now, let me see if I can remove all this writing and whether you can read that. Can you read the EMF of the cell? 
Well, it says 6.79. Well, let me get the correct angle. 6. Point well, it keeps changing. Is that right with time? Now it says 6.84. So, when you connect a cell to a voltmeter directly, what the voltmeter reads is the EMF. In other words, the cell now has made available a potential difference of 6 volt so that if you now connect a conductor across the cell, a current can flow. Now, what does that mean? You have an EMF of 6 volt. It means the cell can now make available 6.8 joules of energy when one column of charge is taken through an external conductor. That's the meaning of that. 6.8 volts. Volts is joules per column. For every column of charge that passes through the cell, the energy that the cell can make available to an external circuit is 6.8 joules. That is the meaning of the EMF of the cell. Okay. Now, when the cell drives a current in an external circuit, the current also passes through internally in the cell. That means, uh, remember, 6.8 joules, uh, 6.8 volts is the EMF means the cell makes available 6.8 joules of energy to drive current externally and internally. And part of that energy is actually used up in driving current internally through the cell. So, a part of this energy E is used in driving current through the cell. That means only the remaining will be made available for the external circuit. Only the remaining energy is available to drive current externally in the conductor. Now, the potential difference between the poles of a cell therefore will be less than the EMF E when it drives a current in an external circuit. Well, let me see if I can demonstrate that to you. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow a current to flow in an external resistor. Now, here I have an external resistor. I'm going to allow a current to flow in that external resistor. Well, assuming that you can see this. Well, okay, let's uh, get the cell one more time. Now, what is the EMF of this cell? Um, I think I'm going to change this meter. Can you read that? It's 7.29, it says. Now, I'm going to change that meter to this volt meter, which is, uh, let me see, that will be negative. I connect the negative to the black, and uh, can you see where the pointer now is? The pointer now is over here. And this is the EMF of the cell. I have connected the cell directly to the voltmeter. It reached the EMF, and that's about 7 volt. Now, if I take it away, you can see the pointer will move back to 0. All right? Now the pointer reads 0. Well, okay. Now I connect it back. The pointer reads 7. So the EMF of the cell is 7 volt. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to connect an external resistor to the cell so that the cell will drive a current in that external resistor. And this is the external resistor. I showed you this some time ago. I'm going to connect this to the cell. 
It's very simple for me to connect it to the cell. I'm going to connect this to one end of the cell and to the other end of the cell. Let's see what happens to the voltmeter reading. Can you tell me what happened to the voltmeter reading? It fell back to 5 volt. That means when the cell is driving a current in an external circuit, the current also goes through internally. Now, this reading, what you see in the voltmeter, is a measure of the energy made available for the external circuit. That means this is less than the EMF of the cell. Now, what happened to the rest of the energy? The rest of the energy is used in driving current through the cell. That is what it means. Well, I don't know how far you have really seen it, but uh, let's continue. So, what is the terminal potential difference? What you saw, the 5 volt, is the terminal potential difference when the cell is driving a current in an external circuit. Now, potential difference can be measured using a voltmeter. When a voltmeter is connected across the cell, when it does not drive a current in an external circuit. That is what we call the EMF. You see, when you connect a cell to a voltmeter, well, let me see if I can use this voltmeter to show that. Now I have a voltmeter, I'm going to connect that, well let's take, let's see if you can read this, now can you read this? I have connected the cell directly to a voltmeter. This is the EMF. When a cell, when a voltmeter is connected across the cell, when it does not drive a current, this cell, let me show you the cell. This cell is now not driving a current. I haven't connected a resistor on the, on the cell. That means it is not driving a current in any circuit. The potential difference now is the EMF. Now, when I allow a current to flow in a conductor externally, the potential difference will become less than the EMF. And that potential difference is what we call the terminal potential difference. Alright, so when you connect the cell to a voltmeter, what the voltmeter reads is the EMF E. When the cell drives a current in an external conductor, the voltmeter reading gives the terminal potential difference V. I'm going to connect an external conductor. See here. Here I have connected an external resistor now. Now the voltmeter reading is no longer the EMF, but the terminal potential difference V, which is less than the EMF. Why it is less than the EMF? Because this V is a measure of the energy the cell makes available to drive current in the external resistor. That means the remaining energy is used in driving current through the cell. All right. If you now consider the current flowing internally, externally, and through the whole closed path, I'm going to now take the whole circuit into three parts the external circuit, the internal circuit, and then the whole circuit, internally and externally. And we will write equations for all the three. So here, I have a cell connected to a voltmeter. Look at that. And I have connected the cell to an external resistor. Now, when the current flows in the external resistor, the voltmeter reading will be the terminal potential difference. Now, 
If V is the potential difference that drives a current in the external resistor R, you see that V, the terminal potential difference, is the, is the is the potential difference that drives current in the external resistor here. And E minus V, the difference between the EMF and V, the terminal potential difference, is the potential difference or the energy that drives current internally through the cell. So this is for the internal circuit. And V, the terminal voltage, is for the external and E is for the complete circuit. E is a total measure of the energy the cell makes <coughs> available to drive current internally and externally. V is the energy used for driving current externally only. E minus V is the energy used up internally to drive current through the cell. So you got external circuit, internal circuit, the whole circuit. Now if I is the current that drives, that the cell drives through the external resistor, if that's the current I, and this current I is now established due to the terminal potential difference V. And if the external resistance is R, then the same current I will pass through the cell as well. And let us say the cell offers a resistance for the flow of current. We will represent that resistance by small r. And the small r is represented by that symbol. We say that is the resistance offered by the cell. We normally, by convention, keep it inside a circle, showing that this small r is actually the resistance offered by the cell internally. All right. For the external circuit, potential difference V drives a current I in a resistance R. Can you write the equation connecting V, I and R for the external circuit? Yes, very simple. V equal to I, R. V is the potential difference across this resistor, which we call the terminal potential difference. I is the current flowing in that resistor, and R is the resistance. So V equal to IR, this is the equation for the external circuit. All right, V equal to IR. Now let's write the equation for the internal circuit. It is E minus V that drives current internally to the cell. The current is the same I, but the resistance offered by the cell is small r. Can you write an equation for the internal circuit? E minus V equal to I times small r. That is the equation for the internal circuit. There you are. E minus V equal to I r. And for the whole circuit, the EMF E is the total energy used for driving current externally and internally. So the total resistance that is R plus R now, this R plus the internal resistance R. So the EMF E drives a current I externally as well as internally through a resistance R plus R. That equation is E equal to I times R plus R. So we have an equation for the external circuit. We have an equation for the internal circuit. We have an equation for the whole circuit. In fact, if you add equations 1 and 2, that is our equation 3. Okay. Let us divide equation 2 by equation 1 and see what happens. Take equation 2 and divide it by 1. What does that mean? Take the left side of equation 2, divide it by the left side there. Divide the right side of equation 2 by the right side of equation 1. So that, that would be E minus V divided by V. I divided the right side by the right side. 
must be equal to I R divided by I times big R. I hope you understood this. The left hand side of equation 2 divided by the left hand side of equation 1 equal to the right hand side of equation 2 divided by the right hand side of equation 1. What does that do? I and I will cancel. And this can be written as, can you understand this? This is E over V minus V over V. In other words, it is E over V minus 1. And the right side is small r over big R. And uh, let's now solve for R. If you now multiply both sides by big R, I will get small r alone. Small r alone is big R multiplied by E over V minus 1. In other words, we have now an equation for the internal resistance of that cell. Okay, now here we have the cell driving a current externally as well as internally. The cell has an internal resistance given by the external resistance R, that is the resistance of the filament, times E over V. Tell me what is E? E is the EMF of the cell. That is what the voltmeter reads when there is no external circuit. That is your E. And V is the terminal voltage, the voltmeter reading when the cell drives a current in the external circuit. So R equal to big R times E over V minus 1. That is the equation for the internal resistance of this cell. The voltmeter reading when the switch is open. If you open the switch, there will be no current flowing externally. At that time, the voltmeter will read the EMF. And when you close the switch, a current will be established and the voltmeter reading then will be V. That's the difference between the EMF and the terminal potential difference. Let's do an example. A cell of EMF 1.5 volt and internal resistance 0.4 ohm is connected to a flash lamp bulb of resistance 1.5 ohm. What is the current through the filament? Right, pick your data. We have the EMF 1.5 volt. The internal resistance of the cell is 0.4 ohm. The external resistance is 1.5 ohm. Here we can use the formula for the whole circuit. Is that right? What is the formula for the whole circuit? E equal to I times R plus R and that will give us the current. So E equal to I times R plus R solved for I or just use the values. E is 1.5, big R is 1.5, small R is 0.4 and that gives me 1.5 equal to 1.9 I Therefore, I equal to 0.79 ampere. Another problem. When a cell of EMF 2 volts is connected across an external resistance of R equal to 2 ohm, a current 0.625 ampere flows in the circuit. What is the internal resistance of the cell? Well, this is the problem we have. When a, a 2 ohm resistor, when a, a cell of EMF 2 volts, there you are, so EMF of the cell is 2 volts, and its internal resistance is, we don't know, we need to find the internal resistance. It is connected to an external resistor 2 ohm, a current of 0.625 flows in the circuit. There you are. The current is 0.625 ampere. 
Now, first we find the terminal voltage across the resistor. You see, if you can now find, this is the resistor, the value of the resistor is 2 ohm, and the current in it is 0.625 ampere, we can use those two values to find the potential difference across the resistor. Can you? What is the equation? V equal to Ri. Now, use those values, that would be V equal to 2 ohm times 0.625 ampere, that is 1.25 volt. So, it means 1.25 volt is the terminal potential difference. Or, EMF is 2 volts. That means the cell makes a total energy of 2 joules per coulomb for the entire circuit. Out of that, 1.25 joules is used by the external circuit and the remaining is used by the internal circuit. Now you know the terminal potential difference V, we can now use that to find the last volt. Last volt is E minus V, which is 2 minus 1.25. Now where is that volt lost? It actually hasn't lost. It is used in driving current through the cell. So, 0.75 volt is now the energy used in driving current through the internal resistance. So this must be equal to I times small r. Okay, the last volt is a measure of the voltage across the internal resistance. So that E minus V, that is 0.75 volt, is the voltage across the internal resistance. The current through the internal resistance is the same as the current in the whole circuit. That means the current that flows in the external circuit also flows in the internal circuit. So using the equation, we can say E minus V equal to I times small r. That is the equation for the internal circuit. And E minus V is 0.75. And we know I, we can calculate the value of R. So 0.75 equal to 0.625 R. That gives me R equal to 1.2 ohm. Okay, let's do a uh, talk about energy in an electrical circuit. What is energy in an electrical circuit? A current in a circuit is caused by the motion of free charges due to the force they experience in the electric field that exists inside the conductor. Isn't it? We know that. A current is caused by the motion of free charges when the free charges are subjected to an electric field. Now this work is done by the electric field in Thus, work is done by an electric field in driving charges around the circuit. And this work done appears in the form of energy in the electrical circuit, very often as heat energy. Now, this energy might appear in the form of heat, light, motion, and in many other forms. Now, what is the definition of potential difference between the ends of a conductor. Now, do you know the definition of potential difference? I have been emphasizing that from the very beginning. Potential difference is a measure of, the potential difference between the ends of a conductor is a measure of the work done per unit charge that moves from one end to the other. Suppose we say the potential difference is one volt. What does that mean? If the potential difference between the ends of the conductor is 1 volt, it means for 1 coulomb of charge moving from one end to the other, the energy used up is 1 joule. 1 joule per coulomb is 1 volt. Means 1 joule of work is done for every coulomb of charge that is moved from one end to the other. So, if you say the potential difference is one volt across this conductor, 
means one joule of work is done per coulomb of charge that passes through that conductor. Now consider a conductor carrying a current I. What does that mean, current I? I, current is coulombs per second. So current is I means I coulombs every second. So consider a conductor carrying a current I when the potential difference is V. V volts means V joules per coulomb. So here I have a, a conductor that has a potential difference of V volt across it and the current is I. Tell me what is the total energy spend by in passing current through that conductor. If the potential difference is one volt, it means one joule of work is done per coulomb of charge. Now, the current is I ampere means I coulomb of charge cross the conductor every second. And the potential difference is V means that for each coulomb of charge, the work done is V joules. So, connect all these. For each coulomb of charge that goes from one end to the other, the work done is one joules. Now, how many coulombs are passing in one second here? It is I coulombs. So, what is the work done for I coulombs? It will be V times I. That's right. So, what is the total work done in one second when I coulomb of charge cross the conductor? For each coulomb, the work done is V joules. Therefore, for I coulombs, the work done must be V times I joules. The total work done in one second is called W equal to I times V joules. This is the work done per second. What do you call work done per second? There's a name for that. This is a measure of the energy converted from electrical to other forms in one second. Work done in one second is called power. And so, what is the equation for power in an electrical circuit? Power in an electrical circuit is I times V, a very important equation. P equal to I times V. Power is current multiplied by the voltage. What is the unit of power? Joules per second is the watt. So one watt is one joule per second. If the current flows for T seconds, then the total energy in the circuit is given by, this is the energy per second. If the current flows for T seconds, what is the total energy spent during that time? It will be the total energy equal to VI, which is the energy spent per second, multiplied by T, so that will be VIT. And if I now write V, replace my V by V equal to Ri, isn't it? Replace my V by Ri, I can write the total energy is Ri squared T. So total energy in an electrical circuit is VIT, which is the same as Ri squared T, which is also equal to V squared over RT. Why? I can write I as V over R. Then VIT becomes V squared over RT. So all these three forms are equivalent forms of the total energy spent in an electrical circuit in a time T. Heat generated in an electrical circuit when a current I flows in a resistor R for T seconds can be written as Q equal to R I square T. If all this energy gets converted to heat, then that quantity of heat generated in a time T will be R I square T. 
Those are very useful equations we will use as we go on. Now, electricity consumption is measured in a unit called kilowatt hour. You pay for electricity and the electricity company measures your electricity consumption in a unit called kilowatt hour. Now, how much energy is a kilowatt hour? One kilowatt hour, which is called one unit, is the amount of ele electricity or amount of energy consumed at the rate of one kilowatt for one hour. So, if you have a 1,000 watt bulb, and if you turn it on for one hour, it will use up one unit of electricity or one kilowatt hour of electricity. One kilowatt hour is 1,000 joules per second, energy used at the rate of 1,000 joules per second for one hour. So if you multiply the 1,000 joules per second by 3,600 seconds, that will be the total amount of energy which is equal to one kilowatt hour. So, if you want to find the number of kilowatt hours, what all you need to do is multiply the power in kilowatt by the time in hour. For example, if I have a one kilowatt heater, if I turn it on for two hours, I will consume two kilowatt hour of electricity. Power used in kilowatt multiplied by the time in hour is kilowatt hour. A 100 watt bulb burning for five hours. All right, how many units or how many kilowatt hour is consumed? 100 watt, write it in kilowatt, is 0.1 kilowatt. Multiply by the time in hour, will consume 0.5 unit. So if you turn on your 100 watt bulb in your bedroom for five hours, you are consuming half a unit. And you know how much you pay for a unit of electricity? It's about 10 cents. So it'll cost you about five cents half a unit, 0.5 kilowatt hour. Now let's do an example. What is the current in the filament of a 60 watt bulb when connected to a 110 volt supply? I've given you the power, I've given you the voltage, find the current. Well, we got the power 60 watt, voltage is 110 volts. What is the equation for power? Power equal to V times I. Therefore, now solve for I. I equal to P over V. Now, P is 60 watt. V is 110 volts. So that will be I equal to 0.55 ampere. When you plug in a 60 watt bulb, onto the 110 volt supply you have in your house the current flowing in the filament of your bulb is 0.55 ampere another one what is the cost of operating a 500 watt electric heater for 20 hours if electricity costs 8 cents a unit well, the first thing to do here is to find the number of kilowatt hour, number of units of electricity. How do you find the number of units of electricity? Multiply the power in kilowatt by the time in hours. So, power is given as 500 watt, which is 0.5 kilowatt. And the time is 20 hours. Therefore, and the cost per unit is 8 cents, which is 0 0.08 dollars. So how many units are consumed? Number of units is power in kilowatt multiplied by the time in hour. Power in kilowatt is 0.5 kilowatt. 
and the time is 20 hours and that gives me 10 kilowatt hour is the total power the the number of units 10 kilowatt hour is 10 units and each unit cost 8 cents therefore the total cost is 0.8 dollars or 80 cents okay let's do another one a 10 volt battery is connected to a 120 ohm resistor calculate the power delivered to the resistor calculate the power delivered well you can calculate the power if you know the voltage and the resistance can you write the equation for power in terms of voltage and resistance all right voltage is 10 volt resistance is 20 ohm we got P equal to V times I but we don't have the current we have the resistance and the voltage so what do I do we can now write this as V squared over R is that right because replace your I I can be written as V over R so V times I is V squared over R and that will be 10 squared over 120 that is 0.83 watt is the power delivered. <coughs> Another one. Batteries are rated in terms of ampere hours. If you go and buy a battery for your car you will be looking for 40 ampere hour or 60 ampere hour and so on. A battery is rated in ampere hour. For example, a battery that can supply a current at the rate of 5 ampere for 10 hours is rated 50 ampere hour. It can supply current at the rate of 5 ampere for 10 hours. Or it can supply current at the rate of 1 ampere for 50 hours. And so on. What is the total energy in kilowatt hours stored in a 12 volt battery rated 60 ampere hour? At the rate of 0.08 dollar per kilowatt hour, what is the value of the electricity produced by this battery? Well, rated at 60 ampere hour means that the battery supplies a current of 1 ampere for, well, I ampere for T hours. You see, it could be 1 ampere for 60 hours, or 2 ampere for 30 hours, or 10 ampere for 6 hours, or I ampere for T hours, then I times T must be 60 ampere hour. That's the meaning. So energy equal to V I T. Now, I times T is 60 ampere hour. V, the voltage is 12 volts. So the energy that battery can supply is 12 volt times 60 ampere hour. That is 720 watt hour. Convert that to kilowatt hour. That is 0.72 kilowatt hour. And the value of the electricity, each kilowatt hour costs 0 0.08 dollars. And that will be 0 0.058 dollars is the cost of the electricity that's supplied by that battery. Let's see if you can get time for this. A 15 watt electric heater is used to heat 100 gram of water in a beaker. If 75% of the heat generated is used for heating water, how long will it take the water temperature to change from 20 degrees to 35 degrees? We got the power 15 watt. It means 15 joules of energy, heat energy, are produced every second. The mass of water is 0.1 kilogram, 100 grams. The initial temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, final temperature is 35 degrees Celsius, and uh, we need to find the time taken. So let's say let T be the time taken for the increase in temperature. 
Now, if 15 joules of energy is produced in one second, what is the energy supplied by the heater in T second? The quantity of heat generated is Q equal to VIT, which is P times T, power multiplied by time. Power is the energy supplied per second. That will be 15 watt times T seconds. That will be 15 T joules. And only 75% of that energy is actually used in raising the temperature of water. So, the amount of heat used in raising the temperature is 75% of 15 T. That is 0.75 times 15 T. That is equal to 11.25 T. Now, this is the amount of heat produced and supplied to water to increase its temperature. Now, if you have a a quantity of m kilogram of a substance that has a specific heat C and if the temperature changes from theta 1 to theta 2 what is the amount of heat required to do that? It will be quantity of heat is mass times specific heat times change in temperature and all this heat is actually coming from here 11.25 T so let's write down the values. M equal to 0.1 kilogram. Specific heat of water is 4180. Change in temperature is 35 minus 20. And that is 6270 joules. And all this should be equal to 11.25 T. So 11.5 T equal to 6270 